Happy Halloween. Ah, fun. Um, I think that's a good day to start exponential functions. Uh, just as a little bit of review here, where is it? From last day, we didn't actually start exponential functions quite yet. We did a review of exponent laws. Now these are of course very important for you to know and love. And so, uh, and we kind of walked through each of the rules and how they work. Um, and there are some go-to rules that we use, right? We use uh, a to the one over n quite a bit to denote the nth root of a. Okay? And then kind of similarly, a to the m over n, which is also relying on, on this little guy. I couldn't think of a, a way, this is just a fact, right? So if you're uh, multiplying the exponents, you're allowed to just multiply them. And so that's where this um, fifth uh, law came from. Okay. Also pretty important is if you have the same base, a to the m, a to the n, if you're multiplying the same bases, then you add the powers. Okay? And of course, if you're dividing the same bases, then you subtract the powers. And we talked about uh, how we didn't really need the seventh property because we have the sixth property. And we know from the third property, right, that a to the negative n is the same thing as one over a to the n. All right, so I need you to be uh, really nimble with these, these exponent laws. All right. Exponential functions. Exponential functions are functions that look like this. Uh, let's see here. Just in general, they're going to look something like this. Okay, exponential growth. We can also talk about about decay, but uh, let's just talk about uh, growth for now. Okay. So today we're going to talk about what does this uh, function look like? What's the anatomy of it? Uh, and then that'll be good. We'll start with an example, um, which we don't really need experience exponent or exponential functions to derive it, you can kind of get there on your own. Uh, and so, well, maybe there's one, one kind of leap, I guess, but uh, India is the second most populous country in the world with a population in 2008 of about 1.14 billion people. The population is growing by about, oh, that's a tiny highlighter. How's that? Better, maybe big. There. Really highlighted. No. So it's growing by about 1.34% per year. There's some sort of reference there that I've cut out. Uh, we might ask if we can find a formula to model the population P as a function of time T which we're gonna make years after 2008. We've seen that trick before where if we have uh, years, then often we pick a starting year and then we make that our year zero. And then we talk about years since that time point. We could use uh, time just as the year, but because 2008 is quite large, it gets kind of weird. And so, uh, So first, let's pick a part. We want to find the population as a function of time. Now we're told what to, uh, what to use. And so really what we want to find is the population P of T right, as a function of time. And where, where T is going to be what? It's going to be the year after 2008. 
And so it's going to be the year minus 2008. Making our initial time point 2008, right, zero. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, T equals zero in 2008. What we want to do then is we want to say, okay, well, then I know P of zero, right? The population size in 2008 is 1.14 billion people. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to drop the billion. Just remember that that's the, um, those are the units. And so here, maybe just, I'm just going to rewrite this here. We want to find P of T. Now we're given P of zero is 1.14 billion. I'll just say let P be in billions. And then we can drop it, can add it back in in the end, but we don't need to. I didn't give myself very much room, did I? Oh, sneaky. <clears throat> so if you know the initial population size and you know the growth rate, what would you do? You would say, okay, then P of one, or should we just do T right away? Because I didn't give myself enough room. <laughs> P of T is going to be P of zero. You start with your 2008, and then we're going to be growing by 1.34% each year. But starting from the initial population, P of zero times one, or sorry, one point three, four, but as a percentage, 0 0.0134. Now, how we do the each year is going to be here. We've got this T in the power to the power of T. This is 1.34%. But in general, for these rates, we're going to be given in percentages, but then you have to convert them to proportions, right, or decimals, uh, whatever you prefer to call them. Okay, so here I'm going to say rates will be given as a percentage, but we need the proportion to do math, to do any, any math on this thing, we need to convert it to a proportion. So divide it by 100. So the proportion, arrow upon arrow, is the percentage divided by 100 percent, I guess, to cancel those percentages. <clears throat> So this, this is the leap, I guess, is the power of T, right? For each additional year, right, then we multiply this initial amount by a power of T, this rate by a power of T. And so now this T is the variable of the function and it's in the exponent and that's what makes it an exponential function. T is the variable in the exponent. Therefore, this is an exponential function. Oops. 
we can pull out a, a common P of zero, which we know is 1.14, but in general, we can have P of zero, just the initial starting point. And we can say, okay, P of T is P of zero times one plus the rate 0 0.0134. just realizing I'm inconsistent here. Let me replace this. Let me replace this with 1.14. Squeeze it in. We do this. When you're trying to figure out what something's going to cost with tax in the store, what do you do? You multiply the price on the price tag by 1.12, right? And that's going to take into account the price on the price tag plus the taxes, right? And so we do that just in life. So we can simplify this as P of T is 1.14 times 1.0134 times T. So let's define an exponential function. An exponential growth or decay function. So things can decay exponentially as well. Right, but usually we're talking about growth, bacteria, population, just all these things have some exponential growth, right? Especially for you guys, bacteria in water, I think is probably the main one. Um, that's a concern. And so uh, you're going to have some percentage growth rate, right? That growth rate, can be small. And so um, that's reflected in this B here. And so here we started, we started and we wrote out our exponential function as f of x is a, which is the initial or the starting value of the function times one plus r, where r is the percent growth or decay rate written as a decimal. To the power of x, right? It's a function of x. And so now x is in the exponent. And so, or what we can do is we can talk about f of x is a times just b to the x. What's all we've done here? All we've done is rewritten one plus r as b. I've right? just replaced it with b. So where b is one plus r. And so this one, I think, is uh, ultimately more useful. We use, we use this to build up the idea. But then in kind of in practice, we're going to use this version of the exponential function, where b is the growth factor or the growth multiplier. Yeah. And so and we're going to limit b to have just positive values. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time talking about uh, linear functions. And then most recently we talked about quadratic functions, right? Parabolas uh, or overall kind of parabolas. And why is there writing here? Oh, well, must be a method to my madness. Um, whereas an exponential function is going to look like this. And so this exponential function has the form a, b to the x, and x is in the power or the exponent. Those are interchangeable, whatever you prefer. I guess I decided I didn't just want to write this out twice so we can talk through it. We already talked about it, actually. So f of x where the variable is in the exponent x, and we have some initial value 
f of zero is equal to a, which means that this function has to pass through zero a just in general. Okay. And so here, therefore, the function must pass through zero a. Because we know when x is zero, well, anything to the power of zero from the exponent laws, let's take it back there, right? Anything to the power of zero is one, right? So a times one makes a. Um, since f of zero is a times one plus r to the zero, which is a times one, which is a. There, now it's complete. So that's nice. So one of the main things that we're gonna do when we build these functions is we have to figure out what the initial value is. We also will be given the growth rate or sometimes we'll have to solve for it. But R is a rate of growth if it's between zero and one and it's going to be a decay if it's between negative one and zero, right? So if it's decaying, which is possible, right, then the rate is going to be between negative one and, and zero. Zero is included here if it's a growth and excluded if it's decay. It doesn't really matter because then it's not doing anything at r equals zero, but just as a side note. Or as we saw, we can replace one plus r with just a b. And so then what we can do is if we have r between zero and one, then we have b is one plus something between zero and one, right? Which means that one plus, even at the lowest end, one plus zero is one. So then b is going to be greater than or equal to one. Right? And that thing is going to look like this, exponential growth. I'll add that. If r is between negative one and zero, if we take it back to b, right, one plus on the lower end, negative one, well, that brings me to zero. Right? And then on the upper end, one plus zero, makes one, right? So then we have decay if B is between zero and one, exclusive of both endpoints, right? Which we force, but it's also because it's not including zero here. Uh, no, that's not why. We force it. So this is what, exponential decay looks like. Okay. For example, tuition is currently $1,050. Wow. <laughs> Sounds nice. I'm going to go ahead and guess that that is not true anymore. Um, no. Uh, if tuition has been increasing by 7% per year, predict the tuition in five years. So we can let, let T be the tuition and we can let T be time in years. That's standard to use T for, for time of course, and usually T is in years. If it's in some other units, you would use something else, but often it's time in years. So just like before, our first kind of stop is to figure out what the initial value is. What's our starting year? So 
t at zero is the current tuition. That has to be the $1,050. So now we also know that here, I'll just say we're given these things. The rate, remember the rate. So here in this case, we're given 7% per year. That's the growth rate. And so uh, the rate R is 0 0.07. So depending on what information you have, we can, we can figure out the tuition. So now just with this information, right, I'm gonna try to map it back to one of these two. They're the same, right? In this case, we've just replaced B with one plus R. So whichever one you prefer, because we're just starting out, maybe we'll just use this one because it's more explicit with the R inside, uh, inside the function. But eventually we'll move we'll move over to a b to the x. So in general, we have f of x is a times one plus r. Oops, to the power. Oops, not t yet. To the power of x. Or we said okay, our function that we want to try to find and map to, map to this general function is some function t of t. A is the initial value, t of zero, times one plus r, and x is the variable to the power of t just in general. but we have all those things. So we can just plug and chug at this point. 1050 times one plus 0 0.07. And then the T just hangs out as a T. Mm, to answer the question, yes. But in, I'll write in the general function, we leave t as a variable. But now the question is in five years. And so that's why letting the, the current year be zero kind of makes sense. And so we want to find t of five, which we can do. t of five is 1050 times 1 1.07 to the power of five. Nifty calculator here, 1.07 to the power of five times 1,050. A whopping 1,472, uh, 6,7,9,3,1,7. But this is money, probably in dollars, I think. Yeah, 1,472 and 68 pennies. Still pretty good. Maybe per class? <laughs> per class, maybe. What is it per class? I was like 14 and a half. I guess another. I'm pretty sure on our website it says it's like 
That sounds sounds yeah, about sounds about that, right. Like yeah, I think that's probably. I'd say it's roughly like three thousand per semester. So that's half a semester. Oh, okay. I don't even know how much. Access to nine. They're like, no, we heard you talking about this, <laughs> yeah, and and we're just temporarily not going to let you see. <laughs> If we have to interpret the equation, P of T, now P, let's assume is a population. T, let's assume is in years. Yeah. We will assume P is a population size. and t is in years. We don't need to establish that, but it's nice to have some kind of reference point. So now, what does that mean? It means that p of zero, at the initial starting point, the population was 1,000. Hmm, I wonder if they're doing like an update or something. I sent you down a, a, a rabbit hole. P of zero is 1000. This 0.83 that's already been combined from one plus R. So one plus R equals 0.83. Solving for R then, I get R is 0.83 minus one. So I get R is negative 0.17. That's a, a decay rate. And so it's decaying at a rate of 17% per year. So this population is decreasing, right? If you have a negative rate. Often things like, uh, um, I don't know. I wanna call them metals, they're not metals. Um, materials that decay, right? Half-life and things like that would take into account the exponential decay rate. And so I, I'm pretty sure I have an example. It's a pretty standard example uh, later on. What if we had to do the next one? You have to find an equation for an exponential passing through the point 0, 3, and 3, 18. What does this mean? Just in general, if we use the general function, f of x is a times 1 plus r to the x, or if you prefer, f of x is a times b to the x, where b is 1 plus r, we know f of 0, oops, from here, both of these, is 3. So when x is 0, the output is 3. The y is 3. By the same logic, f of 3 is 18. 
So now we have another point on this, on this function. Yeah. F of zero is A, right? And so in this case here, we, we have A is three, which is equal to A. Should we start using this one? Just because it's a little bit easier to deal with in this case. I'm going to use this one. You can try the other one if you want. But I want to have less to deal with, right? The one plus R is just baked into B. So let's see here. F of zero is a times b to the power of zero. Let's just show why f of zero is three. Well, b, it doesn't matter what it is, anything to the power of zero is one. So f of zero is a times one. So f of zero is a, which is equal to three. So then I can go back into my original function. F of X is A times B to the X. Now I'm trying to solve for B and I know A is three already. So three times B to the X. We're gonna use the same method that we used before for lines, right? So we had an initial value and then we needed another point on the line. So here I know when X is three, Y is 18. So 18 is three times B to the power of three. And I'm gonna bump this up here. How do I solve for B then? I have 18 divided by three is B to the power of three. 18 divided by three is six, but I like to have my B on the left-hand side. So at this point, I'm going to rewrite it as B to the three is equal to six. Just doing a little switcheroo there around the equal sign. Now, what do we do? B is the third root of six, which on your calculator, although I think we established that you have the open root, so you could do any root on your calculator, but if you had a, a less fancy calculator, maybe I'll show it once here. You wanna take the third root of six, so B is six to the one over three, six to the power of one over three. So B is roughly 1.817120593, I can't stop. I'll never stop. As the overall function, if we write it in this form, what you could do is you could extract an R, but by setting this to be one plus R, right? And then R would be 0 0.817120593. So it just depends on how you want your answer. But in this case, I am going to use another arrow and give myself a little bit more space up here and say that F of X is three. Should we get sneaky and not use the decimal version, but use our exponent laws instead? Six to the one over three. Oops. Six to the one over three to the power of X, which simplifies to F of X is three times six to the X over three and I don't need the bracket anymore, although it's nicer.
I always prefer brackets for multiplication. And that's the exact answer. You could use, instead of the six to the one over three, you could use the decimal approximation, but this is the exact answer. I'm going to add pages like it tells me to do here. Add a page. I think. And you know what? I'll even put it on. Oops. Eek. A. Okay, let me just write this out. Uh, B is roughly 1.8171205934. And then we'll start this on a fresh page. This one's trickier because we don't have the initial starting point, which means that we're going to need to do some work to figure out what the starting point is, A, and then uh, we can kind of unravel it to solve for B. And I'm going to say, let's just solve for f of x is a times b to the x. I think it's going to be a little bit easier than 1 plus r. Right? Like I said, we kind of quickly move to the f of x is a times b to the x. But in its heart, b is 1 plus r. OK. Should I give you some time to try it? You can do it. I'll pause it for a couple of minutes and you can try it on your own before we start together. After I restart the recording, there we go. That would be bad. Okay. Not given very much information here, but we are given that f of two is equal to five. And f of four is equal to one. That much we know. So we don't have an A, which means we're going to have to solve for A and then solve for B. I like to do it in that order. In theory, you could do it in, you could find B first and then A. Um, but what am I going to do? I'm going to take these guys and write them out as just two functions and see what I have. So I have f of 2 is a times b to the power of 2, which is equal to 5. Now, I rarely do my equal signs that way. But the reason I am doing that is because now I can kind of leave this f of 2 behind and just replace it with a five. So a b squared is five. Right. And so now I'm just going to focus on this side. But f of two is equal to five and f of two is a b squared. And f of four is equal to a b to the four, which is equal to one. So now if I just focus on these guys, I can solve each of them for A. That might be nice. A is five divided by B squared and A is one divided by A to the fourth, or sorry, B to the fourth.
now I have a is equal to five over b squared and a is equal to b to the fourth. So what if I just uh, eliminate the middleman and set those two equal to each other? Uh, let's see here. So then how about I write them around a and then I just kind of ignore the a in the middle afterwards. Five over b squared one over b to the fourth. Which means that five over b squared is one over b to the fourth through that chain. Oops. I guess in theory, I'm solving for B first. I always think of it as extracting the A, but in doing that and setting them equal to each other, I am actually solving for B. Never really thought of it that way, but. Okay. So now I can cross multiply, right? I've got a fraction and a fraction, so I can multiply across here and I get five times, let's use the same color, five times b to the fourth is one times b squared. I guess I could have left the b squared because what am I gonna do next? I usually end up doing this kind of getting everything in the numerator so that I can have a good look. But then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna divide both sides by b squared, bringing it over here. Why am I gonna do that? Because if I have b to the fourth over b to the two, that's going to be, I can have the same base being divided. So then I subtract the powers or cancel the powers, okay? So here, 5b to the fourth divided by b squared is equal to 1. I left that 1 over there. But this becomes 5b to the 4 minus 2. Right. Usually, as you get more comfortable, you would just do something like that. But technically, what you're doing is you're bringing this b to the 2 up to the numerator by negating the exponent and then adding the two exponents, four minus two. And my Bs are not looking very good today there, which means I have five B squared is equal to one. This I can chip away and get at the B. B squared is one divided by five. I don't know why I wrote it so small. Because these lines are pretty big. Um, remember when we take the square root, we get the positive and the negative out of it. And so taking the square root of both sides and giving myself another page here. B is plus minus the square root of one over five. However, the square root of one over five is 0. 0.4472. And we know a property of B is that B has to be between uh, zero or greater than zero. And so B is positive root one over five, and I'll do it in red, since B has to be greater than zero. Let me just check something. Okay, phew. 
What was I checking? Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. We said B is roughly, if we do the approximation of the square root of one over five, I get 0.447213595. So what I was checking was that, okay, well, B is between zero and one, which means I should have decay. Therefore, this should be decay, which means it should look something like this. So then what did I check? I checked, okay, I know when X is two, the output is five. And when X is four, the output is one. So that's what I had to go back and check and make sure that this matches a decaying function. And it does because here, if we just kind of imagine it, now I forgot what it is. Maybe I have it here. Oh, five, not four. And when X is four, it's at one. So that checks out. So now I know B is the root of one over five, or if you prefer to use the, uh, the decimal version, I would say keep at least four decimal places. Otherwise it, it might make a mess. Yeah. I'm gonna end up using the, the exact just for practice. Yeah. So now I have B, yeah. but I also already established that A is five over B squared and it should be one over B to the fourth. Yeah. I'm gonna copy this so I don't have to remember it. I guess an image. So now I should be able to use either one of these and I should get to the same A. Otherwise we did something wrong, right? We, we force these to be equal to each other, right? And then we solve for B. So if we don't get the same A, that's a good way of checking your work too. So if I have uh, let's use, I guess, blue. Five over one over five to the one over two to the two. Whoa. Sneaky. But that is how the square root is canceled by the square, right? Is by those exponent laws. We want to know, does it equal 1 over 1 over 5 to the 1 over 2 to the power of 4? <laughs> 5 over 1 over 5, because 2 divided by 2 makes a power of 1. So that's what I mean. We need to be really really good at these exponent laws. One over, one over five to the power of four divided by two is going to be to the power of two. I'll keep an, uh, a question mark there. So now, what can I do to solve this, to simplify? I have a fraction in the denominator. So usually what I do is I rewrite the numerator as a fraction so that I have a fraction over a fraction that I can really visualize. And so five, I can rewrite as five over one. And that's, that's fair, fair game. Five over one, and I'll do it over here, divided by, one over five 
is that equal to, and in the same method, right, I've got a fraction over a fraction by those exponent laws, I'm allowed to bring in the square as long as I bring it into both the numerator and the denominator. So a couple of simultaneous moves here, one over uh, 25. Five squared is 25. Fraction over a fraction. Let's simplify both sides. Five over one times flip and multiply. I always have to use my fingers and just use the um, on the denominator and flip it so I can see it. Five times one. Is that the same as one time one over one times twenty five over one? Looks good. Five times five is twenty five divided by one, which is the same as one times twenty five. Whee. Which tells me what? which tells me that A is 25. And just like that, we have all the components, right? We have, therefore, F of X is A, B to the X. We had to find A is 25. So F of X is, 25 and then b let's use the root of one over five and maybe i'll just use pink for all of it it's more fun one over five to the one half to the power of x, but I can simplify that as x over two. Or f of x is 25 times the root of one over five but then that's to the power of X. What are you gonna do next? Here, you're done, but I encourage you to check your work because you can, right? You have two points of X and F of X, and so you can make sure that they actually work. So now we're going to check your work. Check that F of two, which is 25 times one over five to the power of two over two, which is 25 times one over five to the power of one which is just 25 divided by five, I'm gonna get five, which is what I would expect because that's what I was given here. When X is two, F of two is five. Next, I'm gonna just check that when X is four, I get an output of one. And then I'll be confident in my work f of four is 25 times one over five to the four over two which is one over five squared which is 25 times one over 25 which is one and we were told that when X is four, whoa, when X is four, output should be one. And so our function satisfies those points. 
and I'm feeling pretty good about our function. And so here, that's your answer. One of those two, you don't have to do both, just one. Same method as we did for lines. It's just, we have a, a kind of a more complicated function. That's all with the X in the power, right? But if you have two points, you can plug them in and you can find first the slope and then the intercept, right? But now you have A's and B's in the exponential function. Any questions about that one? No? How about compound interest? Compound interest. Now this is money, so this is kind of important. <laughs> uh, just life skills. So count, compound, do you guys know what compound interest is? Nice. Um, if you don't, uh, if you invest some amount of money, A, little a, then what happens is uh, the bank gives you an interest rate but it's not going to be a simple interest rate where it's just, you know, it's in there for some amount of time. Um, they're a little bit nicer about it. And they say, okay, every, I don't know, six months or two months, there could be compounding periods. Uh, we're going to look at how much interest we, you've earned, and then we're going to compound it. So add it to your initial amount. And then you earn interest on not just your initial amount, but the amount of interest that you've already earned. And so this is kind of a, a nice, nice formula to know, okay? A of T, so capital A of T is just the account value at some time point T. Okay. T is measured in years, and that's always the case, especially for uh, compound interest. Uh, so sometimes you'll be given T in, in months or, uh, I don't know, days. So then you would have to divide it by uh, 12 or 365 or something like that. And so, so you always have to convert your time into years. <laughs> Quite all right. So T is measured in years and you might, need to convert to years. Huh? Little a is the starting amount of the account. It's often called the principal amount. This is the, the amount that you invested, right? Or, I mean, if we think about the, the not as fun Way, the amount that you borrowed, right? Uh, and so R is the annual percentage rate, which is called the APR. Uh, we can also call it the nominal rate just to be aware of the, the different terms, but they all mean uh, the, the annual percentage rate. Now, this is usually the rate that's being advertised. So here I'll say, this is usually the advertised rate. And then K, let's just talk about K before we look at this formula closer. K is the number of compounding periods in one year. And so some common Ks, if K is one, then it's compounded annually. Uh, and maybe, just maybe, I'll do the common, I can't remember if I have, okay, we kind of do, but, um, I 
I didn't give myself very much room, did I? Got more to say. If K, then the compounding, if K is one, it's annual. If K is two, it's semi-annual, and maybe I don't need a line for each. Wait, maybe I do because can't move these easily. Twice per year is called semi-annually. The next common K is going to be four, which is quarterly. Quarterly is, is kind of a tricky one because quarterly is four times per year and a year has 12 months. So 12 divided by four means that each quarter has three months which is kind of confusing, I think. Every three months is a quarter of the year. But your compounding frequency would be four for quarterly. The next kind of common compounding period is going to be 12 monthly. And let's see if what they have here. Uh, No. Uh, it gets kind of weird because, uh, let's see here. Semi-monthly is 26, but let's just go to weekly. 52 is weekly. We use 365 for daily, and that's as far as we'll go. On the test, if I get you to do one of these, then I would give you what the K is, because I don't expect you to memorize these. Uh, in business math, they have to memorize them, but this isn't business math. Sweat. But good life skills to have. So what this function does, right, is it gives you the account value after some number of years T, after you've initially invested A, and then one plus, and then the rate divided by the compounding period. So this is the, the annual rate divided by however many times you're compounding each year, because you split up that compounding uh, by each year. And then K to the power of T is really the equivalent of doing what? The number of compoundings, right? So here, K times T is really the number of compoundings. Because if you're compounding uh, monthly for three years, right, how would you find the number of compoundings? Well, you would take K, which is 12, times 3, which is T. So K times T is the number of compoundings. Uh, 
How about an example? You invest $1,000 in an account that earns 4% per year compounded quarterly, which I'll tell you, K is four. How much is in the account after five years? Now, a follow-up would be how much interest did you earn, right? How much did you earn on top of your or off of your thousand dollars in those five years? So let's hop to, we know we can write out just this, this empty formula and then we can pick away at uh, each of the components. So if I have A of T is little a times one plus R divided by K to the power of K times T. I was told that I initially invested a thousand dollars R must be 0.04 per year, but K is four compounded quarterly. So I get times one plus 0.04 divided by four to the power of K is four times T, which is five. A of five. Just jumping straight into solving for A of five. You could set it up for a general T if you wanted to, but we don't have to. If we simplify this, A of five is going to be 1,000 times 1.1, right? 0.04 divided by four is 0.01 plus one to the power of 20. Just be careful that power of 20 is only on the 1.1. So I'm going to do that first in my calculator. 1.1 to the power of 20 times 1,000. Yeah. Yeah. I was getting kind of excited about this amount. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 1.01 .01 to the power of 20. Womp womp. That's still pretty good. Times a thousand. 1,220.19004. How much interest did you earn? The interest is going to be a of five minus the initial, or if you just wanted to take a step back and say, okay, if after five years I have 1,220 and 19 pennies, but I only invested 1,000 to begin with, then the remainder is going to be the interest. So then this is going to be 1,220 and 19 pennies, minus a thousand, which is, and I am writing just across 220.19 in interest. Nice. So kind of fun. Play with different rates. Usually banks are kind of secretive about, I find that they, they don't really publish their compoundings, uh, but I know for mortgages, I'm pretty sure most mortgages are uh, semi-annually, so twice per year, so K would be two. Um, and so to figure out how much you have to pay semi-annually. but we're not gonna do that. We can if you want, but there's a little bit more to mortgages than that.
I like the the growth ones. You invest some amount, you make some amount of interest, and then you have a bigger amount at the end. This can work in an opposite direction though, right? If you borrow a thousand dollars at a rate of 4%, which is very, very low for borrowing, right? Then you really end up paying uh, 220 and 19 pennies in interest. But I like the, the positive spin on it. So this is really just to show you uh, how we get Euler's number, E. Probably used E on your calculator. It's just one of the buttons, just like pi, it's an irrational number, but um, kind of a fun exercise is if we have the value of $1, invested at 100% interest for one year, then this, if the compounding frequency is annual, annual, so one, then the A of one or A of T, let's do it in general. A of T is $1 times one plus one divided by, and in this case, k is one, but I'll just do a general k for now, and k times, to the power of k times one. So here, k is one, k is four, k is 12, k is 365, and then I think we get the idea. I don't wanna figure out how many hours there are in a year, could, can figure out how many minutes there are per year and we can figure out how many seconds there are per year but i'm going to tap out at k equals 365. what you'll see or what we would see is that the value is going to start to level off at 2.71828 which is uh, or 2.71828 huh um which is euler's number but here, A of one is one plus one over one to the one times one, which is one plus one to the power of one. So two to the power of one. Maybe let's jump to this one. A of one is one times one plus one over 365 to the power of 365 times one. One over 365 plus one to the power of 365, I get 2 2.7145678. So if we did do all of those for all those Ks, right? The result that we would get is, is out here. What we're talking about here is that we're approaching 2.718282, blah, 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 blah. which is Euler's number E. So here, it does kind of read like Euler, but it's actually pronounced Euler. Euler's number. He's a mathematician. And so Euler's number E, he named it after himself, I guess. Uh, represents the value one over one plus k to the k as k gets big, right? Which is what we saw, right? We had a, an initial amount invested of one and a year of one. And so then we get this, this function, right? We don't really need to know what E 
or where E comes from. It's more if you went into and you kept going into calculus, um, then it's helpful. But for us, we just need to know that it's roughly 2.71828. And there's a song for E, but I don't know it. It's kind of sing-songy though, 2.71828. Two. So what we can do is we can talk about continuous growth because continuous growth, right? This whole thing is E. So what I can do is I can replace that whole thing in my formula with E. And what this ends up looking like is if you have continuous growth, then we're going to use f of x is a times e to the r times x, where r is the continuous growth rate. Um, and, and a is the starting amount, uh, just because it's continuous growth. The R kind of popped out, and I'm purposefully glossing over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The R is just now outside, and we're not going to care about why. So now, versus the original, which was F of X is A times one plus, oops, one plus R over K to the K times T for uh, compounded, uh, for K compoundings. Okay. What I want to do is I want to compare the two, because if we talk about continuous growth, technically that's compounding every moment, right? And that sounds like it's going to be really, really good. But what we're going to see is it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Okay? Because remember, the compoundings is where the bank takes a step back and looks at, okay, I'm going to add the interest to your initial amount, and now you are an interest on that total, right? And then, so if you're doing that continuously, then this is the formula that you're going to use. And I'm going to, this is essentially continuous compounding. So it's always compounding. But first, what I want to do is I want to say, okay, you deposit $1,000 uh, in an account that earns 1% compounded monthly. And we're going to find the amount in the account after 10 years. Then we're going to have the same amount, and I'm going to add pages here, um, that earns 1% compounded continuously. And then we're going to compare those two amounts to each other. And so let's do this one first. And I think I'm going to need more room. But uh, A of T, I used F of X. I shouldn't have A of T. A of T is the initial amount A times 1 plus R over K to the K times T because it's compounded monthly. So K is 12. I want to know when T is 10, if A is 1,000 and R is 0.01, what is A of T? So A of 10 is 1,000 
times one plus 0 0.01 divided by 12 to the power of 12 times 10. Careful when you're solving this thing. You want to simplify this fraction, add it to one, and then take it to the power of 120, and then multiply by 1,000. So I get 0 0.01 divided by 12 plus 1, then to the power of 120, then times 1,000. The amount after 10 years that I get is 1105, and maybe I won't use the dollar sign yet, 0.124896. Then when I round to two decimal places, I'll use the dollar sign. But I'd like to show what the overall value is so you can check your work. 1105.12 uh, pennies. And then So if I initially invested a thousand, that means I made 105 and 12 pennies in interest over 10 years. So hopefully it was worth it. Now we have the same scenario, except we're compounding continuously, which means there is no K. And so what we do is we have this continuous growth rate, f of x is a times e to the r times x. Oops. f of x is a times e to the r times x. This is where it's going to be helpful to find that e button on your calculator. And on my older version of the calculator, it's down and it's in red, so I have to use the, um, the alpha menu to access it. Can I see this new fancy one? Does it look the same? Yeah. yeah, okay, so you have to use the alpha menu to get to E, but then if you go E equals, then you should get 2.71828, blah, 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 blah. So then, If I replace F with A because it's an amount in, in an account to match, I initially invested a thousand still, and then I have E and the rate is 0 0.01 times X, which is 10. So here, R is 0.01. A is a thousand still, and I want to find A of 10. So T or X is 10. Those variables we can kind of swap in and out. In fact, let me add, let me add a more general line here. Or A of T is A E R A times E to the R times T. Make this more. So now using that E button, E to the power of 0 0.01 times 10 making sure that it stays in the power for both of those, and then times a thousand, I get 1105.170918, or A of 10 is 1105 and 17 pennies. That's a huge difference. Huge. Huge. Uh, 
five. Five pennies. That's like a thousand years. They can buy a thousand years. Yeah, yeah it's like, like a dip. Like three months. <laughs> <laughs> if I could dip that long, maybe I'll get five yeah. dollars. <laughs> a lot of money on this question. So is that? that I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure there's a future. The one percent is always going to be compounded, or if it's compounded each, each increment goes up, it's compounded off that. So it's like 105 dollars. Is the interest based off 105? What was it? Or is it just like a always off of the thousand? Uh, so compound interest is going to take, um, yeah, your initial amount, and then it's going to add on the interest that you've earned, and then you earn interest on both of those parts. So that's why compounding continuously sounds so good. But what happens is your rate is basically divided into continuous increments. And so that's why even compounding, this is compounding monthly. So at the end of each month, typically uh, at the end of each month, right, then the bank would take a step back and say, okay, how much interest did you earn this month? add that to the initial amount, and then now you're earning interest on that for that month. And then at the end of that month, they compound it again. And so you're, you're earning interest on more and more each month. But as we saw, there's really not that much difference between monthly compoundings and continuous compounding, which would be you know every millisecond, blah, 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 but it's because it breaks up that rate into very, very small increments. So kind of fun to know because it is tempting to have continuous compounding, uh, but it really doesn't make a difference. Well, it does, but five pennies in this case. If you're investing like 10 million, maybe play around with that for a hundred years, Could play with that, but let's do another example instead. So money, uh, bacteria, all these things can grow at a continuous rate. And so this is the thing to look out for is if I tell you that it's a continuous rate, then you know to use the continuous growth rate formula. Okay. And so let's see here. If it's a continuous rate, then we have f of x is a times e to the r times x. Now, the rate, this one's kind of, kind of a thinker. R is 0.04 per hour. So what you can do is, I think the easiest thing to do is convert your X to be in hours. So we let X be in hours because that's what our rate is given as. which means that over one day in hours, then that's going to be converted to 24 hours. If you wanted to, you could have changed this 0.04 to be some rate per day, but um, that makes it a little bit trickier. And I just always find that if I convert the day into whatever the rate is given as, um, it makes it a little bit easier. But you can try both, right? 0.04 divided by, uh, or I guess times 24. But if we do this, I get, and I guess I have A is 1,000, kind of our standard starting point. 1,000 E to the power of 0.04 times 24 hours. 
uh, e to the power of 0 0.04 times 24 times 1,000. I feel like I may have bungled it. I get 2,611.696473. So you guys get. Nice. So how much will a population of a thousand uh, bacteria grow to in one day? They're going to grow to 2,612, let's say, bacteria. It's hard to have a fraction of a bacteria. In one day. Oops. Hey, this clock has stopped. And I just noticed now, how sad is that? It's been messing with me like the whole class. I thought it was like daily saving or something. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, it's on Sunday. <laughs> it's this week, it's like a few days. It is on Sunday. It is nice. Oh, is it going back? No, back. It's the yeah, good it's one, good. which still messes with me though. For some reason, it like makes me all, yeah. Monkey. Okay, I think that's the end. This is the end of 4.1. And so I don't want to start because it's quarter or 20 to 8, I guess. Uh, no, it's not, but it is 20 to 10. Uh, and so happy Halloween. With that, I release you. And, and we'll start 4.2 next week. All right.